We are going to the Philippines tonight. You told me to turn this on. Okay, I think that turned it on. And let's see. We are. We're going to the Republic of the Philippines. This one is different. It's a different mission study from anything I've ever done before, and I don't know why it's so different to me, but it is different. We're going to start out tonight, and I'm just, we're just going to talk about a few quick facts about the Philippines, because I think you need to know some of those facts about it before we get too deep into studying what the missionaries are doing. That is not what I'm supposed to be seeing. <laughs> it's close, but it's not quite. To view or to slideshow or something's up there that you pointed to. Okay. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay. Capital city is Manila. It's the most densely populated city in the world. The islands themselves are very small, and there are lots of people there. There it is, and you see China uh, in the upper left-hand corner. Water all around it. The little edge, he told me to use that other thing, that right there. The little edge of Vietnam right there. Mike tried to instruct me in this. The little edge of Vietnam, the South China Sea, the Philippine Sea, the Zulu Sea, and the Celeb Sea. But, and then there's Malaysia and Indonesia. That is the Philippines right there. Look at all those little islands. That's the entire nation. There are 7,640 islands. And only about 2,000 of them, they think, are inhabited. They're really not real sure how many are have inhabited because there's some of them that they just don't get to. Transportation is a problem. It's called an archipelago. A chain of islands covering 120,000 square miles. Most of the islands have no name. The major islands we refer to, well, we'll get there. Let's don't jump on. It's, the actual land is about the size of our state of New Mexico. Its population is 109 million people. A lot of people. They speak 120, at least 120 languages. So if you're a missionary and you stop start working on one of those one of those little bitty islands right in there and then you go up here and pick another little bitty island you may have to learn a whole new language to move from one island to another it's a difficult field for the missionaries it's divided the country is divided into three major areas Luzon it's the top big island. This, I practice saying these names. Bazila, Bazila is the middle island, and Mindanao is the bottom island. They're the three main divisions of the country. But look over here at all the different colors in this book, this map. These are the ethnic groups that are there. And some of them, they're really hard to see, are really tiny. This, this, uh, this little island right there, that little island, and then that little brown area right there, that's all it is. And then we go way up there. The green is a fairly big area. That's a different color brown, more red in it than this one down here. All of those ethnic groups are there. So many changes when the missionaries move from place to place. They are the, the main ethnic groups that you see there, with the main one being the one we talk about the most, is the Tagalog. They're the main <coughs> group of all of those different groups. And in those different groups, almost every one of them professes some kind of different religion or different idol that they worship. It, it differs from place to place. The main re religion is Roman Catholic. If you go out on the street and you ask people, they'll tell you they're a Christian. 
they're probably Catholic. And even the Catholics still worship idols. So it's really a hard field to work in. And yeah, you're saying just there or in general? In there, in the Philippines. The map, it's red, it's blue, and it's yellow. The country's nickname is the Pearl of the Orient. The official languages are Tagalog and English. 14 indigenous languages are spoken by about 13 million people <coughs> all over the place, wherever we go. The white in the flag represents liberty, equality, and fraternity. The blue is peace, true, and justice. And the red is patriotism and valor. The stars, the eight, the golden big star has eight primary rays, and they represent the provinces that were involved in the revolution against Spain. The fine pointed stars represent the country's three main islands that we just named, and I'm not going to say them again. <laughs> they have one active volcano. Its name is Mayan. It's active and located in the south of the island of Luzon. Luzon was that top area. In the southernmost part, there's the active volcano. <laughs> This volcano is one of the biggest volcanoes, one of the biggest volcanoes around. It's not that big, it's just that it's active all the time, but okay. it's not all that large. So somewhere over there, there is one that's classified as very huge. Yeah. The main train of kind of transportation are called jeepneys. The jeepneys look like buses. They're all brightly colored, and it's their main way of transportation. There are not many cars on the Philippines. Very limited. Boats are used to travel between the islands and some of those trip, trips between the islands can take 20 hours. But I enjoyed looking at the different pictures of the jeepneys because they were, some of them were just really hilarious the way they were painted and all the different colors that were on there. But you see them all over the islands. Many of you know the story about MacArthur. He fled from uh, the Philippines and went to, the, to Australia. And while he was in Australia is when he made that famous speech saying, I, will, I shall return. And he did return in 1944. He fulfilled his vow or promise that he made to them. And in turn, this one is MacArthur, right there. And that, those are statues out in the edge of the water that show him coming out and returning to the to the Philippines, just as he said he would. Well, I bet everybody remembers Imelda Marcos <laughs> and her shoes. Well, that's a picture of her shoes. There is actually a shoe museum in the Philippines. I had never heard of a shoe museum, but there is one. And the, the shoes there, it talks about the, their opulent lifestyle, and you remember seeing her on the news. She was a um, pretty self-centered lady. When they stormed the palace, when they unseated her husband, they went in search of what was going on, and they found she had 2,700 pairs of shoes. And she said, they went into my closet looking for skeletons, but thank God, all they found were shoes. Beautiful shoes, you know, that's what she said. So there are her shoes, and they're all in this museum now. Religions in the Islands. Baptist missionaries came to the Philippines in 1948, so they've been there a long time. Didn't happen recently. They've been there a long time, shortly after the war. World War II, I said the war, World War II. They went into the Philippines. The majority of the Philippines will tell you they're Catholic. About 81% of the people. Or if you mention, see these Catholics on the street and ask, you ask them, they'll tell you they're Christians. But underneath all of that, the ancient religion which is still practiced is animism. And that is a belief that everything in nature has a soul. Everything in nature. That includes not just animals, but plants, big trees, rocks that lay on the ground. They all have a soul. And the people mix that with their Catholic views and 
they have really what you would call is a skewed idea about religion. They tend to worship idols. The evangelicals are also there and did a little research because I was wondering how much difference is there between Baptists and evangelicals. Not much, just some little things here and there. But they have a pretty good representation there in the missionaries. 5% of them are Muslims. That's the hardest group that they have to work with. 90% identify themselves as Christians but do not know or understand what the Bible teaches. They know who Jesus is, but they don't know anything about salvation, the promise of eternity, how to make the, make the Lord, and Lord Jesus their Savior and the person that they're going, to let, they're going to follow for their lives. They know nothing about that, even though they'll say they're Christians. Santa Vida. In the 16th century, Ferdinand Magellan presented the Philippine Islands with Santa Vida. And there he is. And he is supposed to be a replica of Jesus, dressed as a Spanish monarch. And he gave this to the island. That is the Santo Domingo. But there are many, many replicas across the islands. They love it. They think it's the most wonderful thing in the world. It's almost cult-like and deeply rooted in the people. They have small replicas they carry around in their pockets. There are pictures of it everywhere on the streets. When they're having their festivals, people carry the statues out on a, you know, with poles on it so they can lift it up and carry it around. But they see it as an idol and something that they worship. There is a Santo Nino fe festival I'm going to come back to that picture in just a second. It should have been the second thing, not the first thing. The festival is a month long, and it's compared very closely to Mardi Gras. Well, what does that tell you about it? We all know what Mardi Gras is, and we know what goes on at Mardi Gras. Last for a month, one to two million people attend. They come from everywhere to attend this festival. There's music and dancing in the street. The statue of Santo Nino is paraded in the street along with replicas of the statue. I th this picture was an afterthought after I had finished my work. There's the Santo Nino dressed a little differently. And like I said, there are lots of them, but he still has on that look of being a monarch. But the face on this one is nicer, I think, than the face on the other one. But look, they put him right in the middle between the Madonna with child, which is the Christmas Madonna, and the Madonna with the cross, which is the Easter Madonna. We see the one with child real often. I don't know that I have ever seen one with the cross in hand, other than a statue that you see in places. You will see them that's holding nothing, but that is the Easter Madonna. I just thought it was interesting. They put this idol right between the two Madonnas. It, it didn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's one of the big ones. This is the crowd that comes for that big festival. Look at the streets, just full of people. They flock there. They have masses. But the interesting thing, what they're lining up and wanting to do is just to get to this the one famous one that's in a glass case, and all they get to do is touch the glass, bow down to it, or kiss the, the glass, and they think that brings them good luck for a year. That's people who are worshiping idols. Wayne and Sharon Segrist and the difficulties they face. Let me backtrack a little bit and say to you something that I've told you before, but you're probably just like I am, you don't remember everything. Um, most of these names that you're going to hear tonight are not real names. A few of them are, but there's the, the
the fear among these people that some there might be retaliation from some of the groups so they don't always put their names out um, ladies that come to WMU and Patty can tell us that real often when we read the birthday calendar it's no it'll be NM no name because we're praying for someone specific but we just don't know their name so these names are probably not real names Wade and shared secrets describe Catholicism as being a veneer, kind of a covering that goes over animism. One of the stories that Wade tells is about a farmer. And he claims to be a Catholic. That's what he says he is. But he might kill a chicken, take all that chicken's blood out, and spread it on his crop land because he figures that will help. I mean, he believes that that will create a big, nice crop, and that it will keep all the spirits away from the crop. But he's, he said he's Catholic, but he still does this ritual stuff, and they have to deal with that <coughs> on a regular basis. Those who accept the gospel are often persecuted in the form of ostracism from family, and cemeteries will not allow them to be buried there. Um, one of the stories that he tells has to do with a young lady that had been coming to their meetings, their religious meetings, where they were teaching them about Jesus and about the gospel. And she eventually had learned and had accepted Jesus as her Savior. She was so excited the night that she accepted Jesus that she told the missionary, she said, you know, I've worked so hard to learn and understand everything that you've told me because I'm going home tonight and I want to tell my family about Jesus. She left that night and was never heard from again. They don't know whether the parents actually had her killed or whether they sent her to another island they don't know what happened to her. They never heard from her again. Difficult things to have to deal with. A person will attend mass in the morning and visit the witch doctor at night. It's just common. That's what they put up with on a regular basis. But the one thing they say that helps them, and the one way they've learned to talk to these people, is the first thing they tell them is the creation story. What happened over the seven days when God simply spoke and created the universe? And then after telling them that story, the next set of things they go into are the Ten Commandments. And when they get to that commandment that says that you shall have no other God before you other than me, is at that point that sometimes the light bulb will go off with these people. They seem to understand that they seem to understand that at that point they're doing something that is wrong because they're worshiping an idol and they're putting that idol above God. Another story that the secrets tell is about Theodore. Theodore is a third grader and he comes to their lessons to, that they're teaching with the children. They call them children's camps. All the children come. And when Theodore was coming that summer, while the camps were running on, he memorized every Bible verse that he was given to learn. It makes me think about the things that are going on with our kids and learning memory verses and with Bible drill, that they're learning, the, learning these memory verses, which is so important. And as the, Theodore learned all this and went back out into his neighborhood, he shared with the other children in the neighborhood and the other children in the neighborhood asked, would come and ask for his advice and ask him to pray for them. And he was given an opportunity to share with his friends. As time went on, Wade and Sharon say that Theodore came back and said, you know, I really want to go to Bible school. 
which was, would be Bible college, going to a college or a university where he could learn about the Bible. So they told him he had to work very hard, complete his high school education, and they would see what they could do to help him get into Bible college. They helped him get into Bible college, and he started his, his work on the island with the Filipino people, taking mission trips to distant islands. He felt called, truly called, to serve the Lord. Another activity that Wade and Sharon are involved in is teaching God's Word through agriculture. They set up what they called training sessions for people. The first thing they did was they went to the local government and they told the local government they wanted to do these training sessions. They wanted young people, younger people, to come and they would teach them some proper methods about agriculture. But once they, they, wait, they got permission first, and then they set out to produce what's called, what they called faith gardens. They, these were vegetable gardens, and they did it with organic methodology. Composting, they raised chickens for their manure to use as fertilizer. Land rotation, they tried to teach them all these things, good things about proper farming. They also taught nutrition, herbal medicine, and personal hygiene. In 2021, they had 77 graduates of the training sessions. But the key thing that went on during these training sessions is that it gave them that little niche in order to introduce the Bible and explain that it is the standard for moral values and good behavior. So, through teaching agriculture, they were able to teach people about the Bible and about God. It was a bridge for them. It just opened the door so that they could spread the Word of God. Not everyone becomes a Christian, but they're one step closer to doing so because they have heard, they have heard the Word and they know about Jesus. Filipinos celebrate in a big way. No matter what it is, they celebrate in a big way. When they celebrate Easter, we know about Holy Week. We understand what goes on with Holy Week. Starts with Palm Sunday and ends on Easter Sunday. We know what's going on. But they celebrate for a whole week. And look at the second sentence up there. Can you imagine the shopping malls in our country shutting down for a whole week? They do. It's closed down for a week. A whole week that they do this. So they celebrate Easter in a big way. All attention turns to remembering Jesus. They know who Jesus is. They know he died on a cross. And they know he rose again. But he, they have not made that step to accepting him as, they, as their Savior. They have a lot of strange things that go on during this week. One, many abstain from eating meat or drinking alcohol. Interesting. They switch off their TVs and radios. And on Palm Sunday, palms are carried to the church to receive a blessing from the, thief, from the priest. Um, not unusual. We sometimes have palms here at Dan River on Sunday morning. But we don't feel that we have to have these palms in order to receive a blessing. They put them in their windows, they put them on their altars, and they believe that the palms protect them from evil spirits. You understand all the underlying of witchcraft and stuff that's going on here, and getting past that is somewhat difficult. I think the next slide is a picture. That's the people with their palms going into the church to receive a blessing. And we're going to talk about Holy Week a little bit more. Jesus' journey to 
Calvary is depicted in processions on Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday. And when I say depicted, they literally depicted. People actually take turns carrying the cross up to a place representative of Calvary. On Monday, Thursday, they take the Lord's Supper. Some reenact the washing of the feet. On Good Friday, they attend Mass and they observe the Stations of the Cross. I don't know whether, how many of you have ever seen the Stations of the Cross. I thought there were 12 of them. I'm wrong. There are 14. I learned something new. There are 14 Stations of the Cross. And the Stations of the Cross start with Jesus' birth, depict important things that happened in his life all the way to the resurrection. So, see, they know about Jesus. They know about the Stations of the Cross. When we went to the Ark, we were privileged to see the Stations of the Cross in a basilica that were just beyond beautiful, undescribable, if you ask anybody in the group that went. They were made from mosaics that were about the size of the end of my little finger. Gorgeous predictions, renditions of Jesus' life. The other thing they do is that they re some of them reenact the flogging of Jesus, and others, do you see what that says? Others crucify themselves for a certain amount of time. And that's kind of dedication. Black Saturday is observed as a day of mourning. They have late night vigils, they sing, and in some areas they burn a figure of Judas. I guess what amazes me most is that they know all this story, the, the facts. They know about what happened and what went on, all of this, but they still don't understand Jesus is their Lord and Savior. At the dawning of Easter, Jesus' resurrection is celebrated by two processions, one starting at one end of the street, one at the other end of the street. One end of the street is representative of Jesus. The <coughs> other end of the street is representative of Mary. And they come together, and it represents the meeting of Jesus with Mary outside the tomb. And she, Mary's wearing a black veil, and at that time they remove her black veil. At the point where the, the black veil is removed to signify the end of the morning, they're no longer morning, and at mass, flowers are placed at, at Mary's feet. And now I want you to see some of these pictures. I mean, these are real pictures. This is what happened. That one over at the end, this gentleman is carrying the cross, just like Jesus carried. You see what's happening there? You see the hammer? And you see the nail? And then there they, they are. Now, it says they stay up there for a specified amount of time. And nowhere could I find an amount of time. But I have a feeling they don't stay up there more than... I'd say 15 minutes max, and I suspect some of them don't stay there but five minutes. But they do this. There's another one carrying the cross. And you see, you see the gentleman right there? You know he's being cruel to this man. He's doing something harsh to him by the expression on his face. And then there they are. <clears throat> These look like, see how they're tied? And there's tied. So I wondered if these were nailed or if they were just tied up there. But there's no doubt of what they're doing right there. Because you can see the hammer and you see the nail. And I guess in that right there still, they're tied in that position there. And maybe that takes some of the strain off. But can you imagine? I cannot imagine people doing this, but they do. As part of their Easter week. Now, if you thought they celebrated Easter, just wait. A hundred and thirty-one days. It starts on September 1, and it goes until some, the second or third week in, in January. It kind of depends on how it falls out. A hundred and thirty-one days. On September 1, they start putting up the decorations and singing the songs. 
Now, we, <laughs> we don't quite do that bad, but we talk about, you know, people who start it before Halloween. But they've got us by about two months, even if we're talking about how we do it in Halloween. 131 days to celebrate Christmas. They last until January. Ornamental lanterns shaped like stars are displayed. These represent the star that led the wise men. I got interested in these stars. And I'll tell you how, I mean, I had read my material, so I knew what I was thinking about. I don't watch much TV, but one night I happened to be watching TV. I don't know what I was watching. I have no idea what the program was, what it was about. But I had heard the word Philippines and my, and my attention perked up immediately. They were having some kind of party. And the lady of the house was standing greeting people and she was standing right beside one of these stars that were the Philippine stars with the light inside it. And someone came in the door and when he came in, and this is when I perked up, he looked at her and he said, What's your, are you, uh, is your heritage from the Philippine Islands? And she said, yes, I am. And she said, how did you know? And he pointed to the star and he said, you have a Filipino star lantern on your wall. And it was beautiful. I think I have a picture a little bit later. December 16th marks the beginning of a series of nine masses that are attended in the pre-dawn hours, usually between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. I, I know we're, we're, all of us are good churchgoers in here. But how many of you folks would get up nine days in a row at 3 a.m.? You would wear out after a while. But remember, they're probably vacationing because they've shut down for a good deal of the tribe for, for Easter. But nine masses, they're attended in the pre dawn hours. Starting December 16th, nine plus 16 would give me 25, so they end on the 25th. On Christmas Eve, midnight mass is attended, followed by a late night feast, roasted pig, cheese, spaghetti, hot chocolate, and Filipino bread. And I just was curious as to what Filipino bread was. And I still don't know what it is. It does have a name, Pandersal, and this is what it's made from. Eggs, flour, salt, sugar, and yeast. It doesn't sound that different from what we would make with our bread. But listen to what they fill it with. They fill it with cheese, coconut jam, which I've never seen, peanut butter, fried eggs, sardines, or other cooked meats. And that's part of their feast that they have on Christmas Eve, following midnight mass. The final mass on Christmas Day is called the Rooster's Mass. <laughs> I could not figure out or find out why it's called that unless they think of the rooster crowing and notifying them that it is the day of Jesus' birth. They believe their, their wishes will be granted if they attend Mass that day. Very much into uh, cultish kind of things, doing things that create good. The vendors are outside in the church door when they come out and they sell rice cakes in lots of different forms. At Christmas, Filipinos visit their extended family to receive blessings. They gather for family meals. Epiphany, or the Feast of the Three Kings, is celebrated on the first Sunday in January, and that kind of brings it to an end. And I think, there they are. And they are beautiful. And, just out of curiosity, I'm going to look at a little bit more, and you can actually buy these on Amazon. If you want one like the one I saw in the TV show, they're stained glass, and they're ranging price from about $300 to $1,000. They're very expensive. But you can buy paper ones that are made out of paper that look like that. And they're like $15, $16, and they're beautiful. They're, I mean, they're very ornate. The colors are pretty, and they have a light in them. And where you see that area that's lit up, that's not really cut out. In the paper ones, it's like a tissue paper placed in there so that the light can get through. But the stained glass ones, you know, the light just comes through that all that different colored gas. They're gorgeous, just gorgeous. Well, back to the missionaries. Terrell and Nita Kilkenny. 
they went to the Philippines and made a decision that they wanted to work with the Muslims. That's what they wanted to do. And God had put it in their heart. Even though we, there are only about 5% of the people there that are Muslims. But that's where they wanted to work. And they were told, you're wasting your time. You'll never get anyone to commit to Christ. Well, that didn't get, get them stopped. They kept on working. Everyone in the area that they went to, they dealt with kidnapping, theft, murder. They even had their land taken away from them. They reached out to fellow Christians to form a prayer network. The most interesting prayer network I've ever heard about. He made an effort to start contacting people. Now, he's in the Philippines. He contacted a Christian that he knew about in Hawaii. And he moved from Hawaii to California. And from California, he went into the Midwest, the middle section of the country. Then he went to the East Coast. He crossed the ocean over to Europe, made some connections in Europe, and went over to Asia. When he said he set up a prayer network, he set up a network all the way around the world. And with, with it being set up that way, the prayer that started in Hawaii at one time, remember it was probably three hours difference, then it went to California, people were praying all around the world for 24 hours for them that they would be able to succeed. They put a lot of effort into setting up this prayer network. Exciting to think. We could have been part of that prayer network. We could have been praying for the Philippines. After living among the Muslims and sharing the love of Christ, they began to see walls come down and a certain amount of, amount of mutual love. Muslim extremists killed the father of one young man who later became a pastor. I always carried the hurt of what happened to my family and wondered why God put me in this position. Now I know it is because we need to reach everyone with the gospel. Another Filipino shared that her brother had been killed by a group of extreme Muslims. I never imagined that I would have anything but hatred and bitterness toward those who had caused me so much hurt. Now the Lord has given me the opportunity and the desire to show his love and to reach Muslim people with the gospel. After she finished, a Muslim believer stood with tears in his eyes and said, On behalf of my people, I want to ask for forgiveness. Small steps to create an atmosphere in which they could teach to the Muslims. Young female missionaries that came to work with Terrell and Nita Kinkili were threatened with robbery and rape if they went into the village. They had found success while sharing the gospel and they wanted to keep moving. They'd been able to enter communities where they were surrounded by armed men from both sides of, of conflict, but the Lord has always protected them and given them peace. So much that now. I want you to meet Stan Smith. Of all the people that I studied about, Of all the people that I studied, he was my favorite. I don't know why, he just became my favorite because I kept searching for more and more information about him. He was born in 1952. Maybe that's what I liked about him. He's, you know, just a little bit younger than us, close to our age. <laughs> At the age of seven, he traveled with his parents for 24 days to become a missionary kid, that's what an MK is, and you see that in all the literature, a missionary kid on Luzon Island in the Philippines. So, when he was seven years old, he left the United States. And for all practical purposes, he never came back till he retired at the age of 70. So he, from seven to 70, he lived and worked in the Philippines. Maybe that's why I liked him so much. They went to Luzon when he was seven years old. Look at this. 
Busan was a town with 300 bars and clubs and 10,000 prostitutes. So, it was an interesting place to live with much to be done. As a child, he didn't know anything but powdered milk. He never received milk from a cow or milk from a goat. It was always powdered milk. He ate tropical fruits. It was either rainy weather or dry weather. And it was so hot you couldn't stand it. He had no other cousins or aunts or uncles except he adopt, was adopted by all the other missionary families that were there. It was an unusual life for a child. In 1969, he made a mission trip with his father, and he traveled through the jungle. He bathed in rushing rivers. He ate wild boar. He rode the back of logging trucks and World War II weapon carriers, and he crossed a river by means of a fallen coconut tree. You know, at, in 69, how old would he have been? Eight, nine, 17? He was young. He could still walk across that coconut tree. I couldn't do that, but he could. And at night, they met in, in grass huts, door flood, door, dirt floor churches, or outside in the nature. And this was his first real taste of true missionary work. And he fell in love with it. His parents came to America on furlough. And while he was there, in America, that's when he realized how much he loved the Philippines and he wanted to go back. In a small hut with 18 people sleeping wall to wall on bamboo mats, he slept next to a former headhunter, and this is what the headhunter said to him. Before I came to know Jesus, I was afraid to die, but not afraid to kill. Now that I'm a Christian, I'm afraid to kill, but not afraid to die. I can't imagine, if I just picture myself in this hut on a dirt floor on a bamboo mat laying next to a fallen headhunter, I probably would have been scared to death. But 17-year-old Stan Smith was not scared. He simply talked about God. He went to Columbia University where he met and later married Dottie, and she was another missionary kid. After he graduated from Columbia, he and his wife spent 37 years in the Philippines. He lived his whole life in the Philippines. He's now retired. He says, I, re I recall barely missing communist rebel ambushes, typhoons we didn't dodge, and coup attempts. His oldest son, they have three boys, and his family are now missionaries in Southeast Asia. Now stop and think. His parents went to the Philippines in 1959. He was born in 52 and he was seven years old when they went. In 1959, his parents ministered to the Philippines. He and his wife went to the Philippines and stayed 37 years. And now his son is in Southeast Asia. Three generations of a family have served the Lord over in the Southeast Asian area. He was my favorite. And here he is. Right there. He and his wife. They look like such a charming couple. A couple that, I, that we would love to meet. Another thing that they do in the Philippines. We do it our favorite time. Another thing they do in the Philippines is they have something called Nehemiah Teams. Never heard of them until I studied this. But Nehemiah teams are composed of young people between the ages of 17 and 29. They can be from the United States or they can be from the Philippines. They like to have pretty equal balance of non-Filipino people and Filipino people because they go through these advanced operations training, the AOT, where they receive biblical training, and how to present the plan of salvation to someone. And they match these folks up because the Filipino youth, they understand the culture and they understand the language and that it makes for better communication between the locals as they work with them. This has been a great program in that they have shared the gospel in a big way 
but many of these 17 to 29 year olds who go through this training and actually do mission work go back and become real missionaries. It's a training field for them, a wonderful program that gives them a great opportunity to do a lot of things. The next thing that I was interested in was something called Destiny Children. Destiny Children is an orphanage. And you know, in an area like the Philippines, there have to be children who have to be cared for. Such a sweet picture of her working with these children. One of the children that they worked with, his name was Rung, R-U-N-G. And he came to the orphanage, he was a sullen, angry young man. <clears throat> they, they tried to love him, they prayed over him, they shared God's word with, with him, but they continued to see anger in him. So much anger in him that they had told him, you cannot harm any person that you, when you become angry. You cannot do anything to harm another human being. That was the first step they made in common, calming him down. His childhood and his family life had been full of rejection, not a lot of love, not it, everything that had happened to him, he'd been cooped up, I guess the way to say it, in a home that's full of anger. And if you're in a place full of anger, you tend to become angry. Over the years while Ron was there, God changed him. And as Ron, Ron changed, he learned to control his temper, he accepted God as his Savior. He started to pray for his father. He wanted his father to come to know Jesus. More than anything else, that's what he wanted. The night, that the first night that his father came to the church, Ron's face showed pure delight. Nothing like they've ever seen before. Ron still prays for his dad that he will come to know Jesus the same way that Ron knows Jesus. But at this point in Ron's life, he's helping to care for the younger children. He willingly cooks, cleans, and helps them with homework every night. And his goal right now is to finish high school and go to Bible college. And the missionaries there have said they will help him do that. Because if he goes to Bible college, he will come back to the Philippines and he will minister to the children. Lots of things are going on in the Philippines. And just recouping on some of them. Remember, they're teaching agricultural techniques. It just opens the door so that they can teach about God at the same time that they do the agricultural techniques. They're drilling wells. They're building sanitary toilets. They're providing water, water filtration systems. They help to meet the physical needs of the people. And there are a variety of them. They have an orphanage ministry, but the greatest need that the Filipinos have is for Jesus. Sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus is what the missionaries do. To move them from their cultish witchcraft worship to understanding that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and that he offers them eternal life. Pray for the Filipino people. Pray for the missionaries reaching out to them that it will be a godly country and that they will lead people to Christ.